Are you ready for some dogs now? Yeah. Anybody, who wasn't here last, last hour? We just have a couple of people. Okay. I will try to make sure that we go through enough information about our, our patterns that we're going through when we're going through our cases so that you guys don't get completely lost. Uh, but we focus mainly on how to use the POVMR to work up a behavior case and went through a couple of cat cases the last lecture. So now we're going to look at the dog side of this. And as I said last time, I try to include cases that taught me a lesson. So you're going to meet some of my favorite, most heartwarming dogs uh, this hour. And we're going to start with my little friend Gilbert. So Gilbert was a young adult uh, male neuter terrier mix. Um, he's about 20 pounds. Um, he was mm, ideal to a little on the thin side from a body condition score. And he actually came into this organization from the local uh, animal care and control. You're fine. Uh, and he, uh, unfortunately for him, this is in Chicago and we are still dealing with uh, uh, canine influenza uh, up there. He promptly got exposed to influenza while he was at animal control. And so he had to be quarantined at this facility um, once he was uh, deemed to be positive. So unfortunately, uh, with the CIV quarantine protocol that this shelter has in place, this is a minimum of four-week quarantine. And because the public perception in the community is that, oh my God, if the dog's been exposed to CIV and he's out on the street, he's going to infect Fluffy and everybody else and, and their cousin, they're not even allowed to get these dogs outside on walks. They have to literally stay inside the building the entire four weeks minimum, and they have to have two negative swabs before they're released from quarantine. So this is a really tough situation for these dogs to be in. Um, and we all recognize this, and so we're kind of working in the less than ideal conditions, and so we're dealing with a lot of behavior problems consequent to this. So he's been in quarantine for CIV. Um, this first video clip uh, is two weeks after he's been in. So he's been in quarantine for two weeks. Remember, he came from animal control. Yeah, he's barking. Everybody else is barking. It's very loud. Literally bouncing off the walls, you're right. So when I go through the shelter, I'm here pretty frequently. I'll actually walk, we'll, we'll go through the cases that they're worried about, and then we always go through a walk through the shelter. And we'll kind of go through, and, and I'll scan, see what we're dealing with as we're doing our rounds, and I'll see somebody, I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. I'll, I'll walk, look at somebody else and go back and see if they're still doing it, and they are. And they're still doing it, and then I start video recording. So he'd been doing this quite a bit um, while we were walking through this run area, and so I went back and got video of him. Um, so this literally bouncing off the walls um, was pretty repetitive the entire time that we were up in this area. Uh, because he had this abnormal repetitive behavior, I think we can all say that this was abnormal repetitive behavior, right? So a dog shouldn't be doing this this frequently. We started him on trazodone. We assumed that he, at this point, had uh, kennel stress from being quarantined and literally not being out of this housing area for the last two weeks. Even though it was a reasonably large-sized kennel run, he had toys in the bed and stuff like that in there, it's still not adequate, right? So we tried to interrupt it, see if we could interrupt this behavior, um, calling his name. And he would stop and he'd look at us. And you may have seen that in the video um, when he kind of jumped up and jumped up and then said, oh, that was me calling him. And then he started it again. And so the trazodone mm, didn't really do a whole lot, so we added clonidine pretty quickly to this guy. So this is in this first two-week period. We had already added two medications. And remember from the first lecture that I gave, trazodone is kind of my go-to uh, immediate acting uh, stress medication. So if I think there's some type of high level of anxiety or chronic stress starting, and chronic stress, we can start to see that as early as three days. This has been two weeks. I start with this medication to try to put a little bit of damper on the fire. Right? That wasn't enough, and this uh, shelter is pretty comfortable with using behavior medications, so we started layering things and knowing this was a high arousal state. So we were first trying to uh, target serotonin with that trazodone. Now we're starting to try to tra uh, target norepinephrine. Remember, with that high arousal, sympathetic nervous system charging, that's where norepinephrine is getting fired out, right? So that's the reason that we wanted to use an alpha 2 in this case. So we have him at this point on clonidine and trazodone. And they're dosing it, I believe at this point they had the manpower to do three times a day, which is pretty amazing. Um, so that he was getting a pretty steady state of clonidine the entire time that he was there. 
And so two weeks later, this is now four weeks into quarantine, so this would be the earliest that he could possibly be let out. We got a chance to reassess and revideo him. I'm trying to call him a little bit, and that made him jump off the wall again. So what do you see? He's better, same behavior but slower. Right. What about the environment? What did they do to address the environment? Yeah, they put a barrier up in front of his kennel to try to block some of the stimulus of the dog right across the aisle from him. See if perhaps that might help a little bit. So if we were going to go through and say, well, we're ready to the point to reassess this pet is the abnormal behavior decreased? Yes or no? Yes. Is it still present? Is his welfare the same, better, or worse? Better. Is it adequate? No. So we still have work to do, right? All right. So let's now, at this point, knowing we've done a little bit of intervention so far and we have a little bit of information about him, let's make a problem list for him now. So who wants to start our problem list? What do you see? Okay, so that's an interpretation. What do you see that he's doing that's telling you he's anxious? I'm not disagreeing with you. Pacing? Hyperactivity, so a lot of repetitive movement? Okay, what else? He was barking. Yes, you couldn't hear him, but believe me, he was barking. <laughs> yeah. Bark, 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 bark. What about his ears? Anybody happen to notice where his ears were? They were back a lot of the time. They perked up and forward, but they were back a lot of the time. What about his face? Was it soft and relaxed, nice almond-shaped eyes, loose lip, or was it really tight and worried? Yeah. Right, really really tight and worried. What about his tail? He kind of has that little curly cute tail. What's that? Carried high. Was it a loose wag, or was it a tight wag? Tight wag? So we've got ears going back, we have a wide eye, tight face, repetitive abnormal behavior, pacing, jumping off the walls, barking repetitively. So can we classify this at any other level higher or can we just keep it at this repetitive abnormal behavior and these other descriptions? Can we call it anxiety? I think we can call it anxiety. I think we can call it stress. Yeah, he's in a negative emotional state. I think either one of those would be appropriate. Yes? Compulsive behavior? So compulsive behavior could be a differential of why he's doing this. So we're going to get to that in just a second. Anybody have anything else they want to do with this problem list before we move on to our differentials? Could fear be driving it? Fear could be a motivation. Yeah, and so that's going into our differentials as well. So what do you think he could be afraid of? The noise, the filter, the smell. Okay. So it could be the environment, it could be the noise. Anything else? The other dogs. I will tell you that all the other dogs were also bouncing off the walls, literally, in that run. And remember, they're facing each other. So he's getting a lot of exposure to other dogs who are really stressed out. Yeah? Is there any relation to the animals, to the kennel? That's actually a really good question. Did, they, did he have any staff time? Did they gown up and go interact with them? We actually had it set so that we had a specific set of staff that were allowed to go into the quarantine area and they weren't allowed in any other part of the shelter after they'd been in there. Uh, so staff time for all the dogs in there was limited. At this point in time, we did have the ability to have people come in and spend a little bit of time with the dogs, but we're probably not getting much more than five or ten minutes a day outside of normal cleaning and feeding. So clearly not adequate that's really isolation and that we had this was during an outbreak where we had a ton of dogs that were crammed in there uh, and not enough manpower to deal with it so it was a tough situation that's a really great question too is there any evidence he was playing with any of those toys not a lot you know they had toys in there they had bedding in there but he was really just urinating on the bedding and not doing much of the toys they became stale after a while right because they're just in there with no interaction so we have on our differential list so far, you had said fear, and you said compulsive disorder. What else could we put on there? Or 
frustration, okay? So we could have what we call a displacement behavior, right? So an abnormal repetitive behavior that's done outside of normal context, but it's not yet to the point of compulsion, and it become, those can become compulsive behaviors when they become uh, emancipated or freed from the initial trigger. So usually it's something very frightening or stressful, and this dog will do this abnormal behavior as a consequence to it. But when it becomes something that occurs in many different contexts, that's when we start to say it's compulsive, particularly if we cannot interrupt it or redirect it. And so that's one of the reasons I wanted to see if I could stop him if I called him. And we don't have enough information at this point, really, to say whether it's compulsive or just a displacement behavior because we can't get him out of this environment. But we do know that he was not doing this behavior in the environment he was in previously when he was at animal control. This was a new behavior after he moved into quarantine. Anything else anybody wants to throw out there for a working differential? Boredom. Boredom? Okay, so motivation to perform a behavior that he doesn't have an appropriate outlet for. That's how I would define boredom or frustration, essentially. Because, you know, remember, boredom is kind of a human construct, right? I'm bored. We'll go read a book. I don't want to. We'll go outside and play. I don't want to. I'm bored, right? You're, you're, you're not motivated to do a behavior at that point. You're just motivated to complain. These dogs are motivated to do something. I want to play. I want to investigate. I want to use my nose. I want to explore. And they cannot do it, and therefore it becomes a frustration-related behavior. So kennel stress was actually a huge thing on my differential for this, this dog. And he's a good uh, d description of what it can look like. And so when we have kennel stress, oftentimes what we are going to see, we're going to see abnormal repetitive behaviors that are a consequence of the environment that they are in, meaning they did not do these behaviors before we put them in this environment. And it is due solely to the stress, anxiety, fear, and or frustration that they're dealing because of what's around them at that point in time. And so abnormal repetitive behaviors, monotonous repetitive barking, uh, sometimes we will see dogs do extraordinary levels of hiding or fear-based behaviors, and that can be considered kennel stress as well. But really the, the most important part of that is that it's a behavior they did not do prior to coming into that environment. So this is an environment problem. Okay, So that was definitely on our differential as well. Any diagnostics you want for this guy? Remember, he's also experiencing a respiratory, a viral respiratory infection right now, and he's barking his head off, and he's bouncing off the walls. What else do you want to know about him? Hmm? Anybody want to look at his feet? I want to look at his feet. I want to see if he's hurting himself. I want to know what the status of his uh, overall physical health is at this point. You know, how bad is he coughing? Is he running a fever? Is he eating and drinking okay despite doing this behavior? Is he losing weight? Is he losing weight because of his physical illness or is he losing weight because he's spending so much energy doing this repetitive behavior? I want to know, does he stop? If we do have the five minutes for our staff member to go in and try to play ball with him in his kennel or sit with him, does he stop? And so he was feeling pretty good at this point. Remember, he'd been here for four weeks, so he was pretty much over his clinical disease. His feet were surprisingly okay, but he was losing weight. And if a staff member did go in there and try to engage him in an alternate activity, he did stop for a little bit. But as soon as they left, it started back up again. He was eating all his food. Yes, that's a good question. And drinking well also. Uh, eliminations were normal. Anything else we want to know or do from a diagnostic standpoint? We could do a blood profile if he's losing weight because we don't know if it's necessarily a medical problem or if it's because of his activity level. So that's certainly something to consider. This shelter is well resourced enough that they are actually able to do lab work when they need to do it. And I believe they had done lab work because he was already physically ill. So we were able to do a quick CBC and, and mini chem on him and they were not exciting. Could you feed him more and see if he gains weight? We could feed him more. They did do that actually. Yeah. What else do we want to do? do we, let's, let's look at our treatment plan because we're starting to kind of delve into that a little bit. Do you want to do the three M's or do you want to do the five steps, how I treat everything? Five steps. Five steps. Raise your hand. A couple of people. Three M's. Nobody cares. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I figured. And it's the last session. It's okay. Let's do the five steps for this one, okay? So first step, how I treat everything. Avoidance. What can we do to avoid the situation that he's currently doing this in, knowing he's in a respiratory quarantine and he's not able to get out of jail yet. What can we do? Anything? 
Barriers, okay, we've already got some barriers up. Good job. Strategic housing. This is one of my favorite interventions to do. Don't underestimate the power of strategic housing as well. If you've got a dog who's really having a hard time dealing with the dogs around them, can we put them in a different place in that same area? Can we put them on the end where everybody's not walking past them or where there's going to be a, a quieter dog directly across from them and that's the only one that they see? Absolutely. Let's do some strategic housing for this poor guy. For sure. Yes. We could do group housing. That's a great idea too. Absolutely. This shelter actually does do quite a bit of group housing. And so this is something that they have attempted to employ for some of these dogs that are really having a hard time with kennel stress and things like that while they're being uh, housed in quarantine. So absolutely. If we've got another dog who's appropriate, compatible, I would definitely recommend trying that. <coughs> Good. Yes. We could do some low lighting, we could do some music, we could do some uh, adaptal, some pheromones. I will tell you that the room that we're actually using for our quarantine, it's actually the second story of a wa uh, warehouse uh, with open ceiling. So this room is massive, so there's not enough adaptal in the world to fill this room with enough to actually impact the dogs, unless we're actively spraying their blankets, and we actually didn't have the manpower to add that in at that point. So. We could do an adaptive collar. Yep. If they had one donated, I would say definitely put it on this dog. What else could we do? What about feeding them? Puzzle toys. Puzzle toys, for sure, right? All meals are coming from puzzle toys. Could we designate a room to exercise these dogs inside? Yes, and this group actually did do that. They set up another large chain link area that they're using as a play yard, essentially, to try to get the dogs out of those runs and to let them stretch their legs a little bit more in a less bouncing off the wall pattern. And if we do have a compatible playmate, maybe even doing some, some play groups in there. Yes, absolutely. So we have feeder toys. We have our medications already on board. We have barriers, strategic housing, social interaction with other dogs. What else? What about the thundershirt? We could do a thundershirt. That's something to consider. But one thing I worry about is that these dogs are housed in chain link runs, and we don't have staff in here all the time. We've got limited interaction. So I worry about these dogs, particularly if they're jumping off the walls, literally getting it snagged on something. Um, if he was more closely supervised, I'd absolutely be OK with that. Anybody want to adjust his medication? We could try to increase his trazodone. Yeah, it was a reasonable starting dose, but we've got plenty of room to go up. I would increase his clonidine, too. I would even consider adding gabapentin. That's a lot of medication for one little dog, right? But isn't he still in a welfare emergency at this point? Literally bouncing off the walls. He's just bouncing slower. But he's still bouncing. So it's still a welfare emergency, right? And remember, this is an environmentally related problem, we suspect at this point. So these are all hands on deck. And once we change the environment, there's a good chance he's going to be okay and we are not going to need them. So these are short-term band-aids at this point. So I would even consider a supplement or another medication for him. Anything else anybody want to do? We're kind of limited here in terms of what our options are because of the quarantine and the manpower. But this and kennel clicker training. Yes, if we had the manpower to do it, absolutely. That was a tough one. I really, really wanted to do that. Um, we didn't have enough bodies. We also investigated doing treadmill because we had a bunch of treadmills donated to them um, and, and putting one in the quarantine area. So if we did have volunteers, letting some of these dogs stretch their legs a little bit, not making them run necessarily because they're on respiratory quarantine, but you know, letting them, them run a little bit. But it was all dependent on whether we had people to man those kind of things. So. So we've already talked a little bit about behavior modification. We already talked a little bit about tools. What about relationship building? Time. What kind of time do you want? If we had 10 minutes, what could we do? What's most important to you for this dog? Sit in the kennel with, the kennel with him. Cuddle him. Yeah, we could do some massage. Try to help reduce that arousal a little bit. If he's like, I can't, I'm going to bounce off you too, then maybe we want to play. What's that? when they're there. Yeah, we could do that. If it stays in quarantine, I don't have a problem with that. Absolutely. We could definitely use clicker training for that five minutes. 
Yeah. If we're gonna if we're gonna strategize, let's make the efficient use of our time, right? Any other tools that we need that we haven't talked about yet? Yes. Can we do some what? Nose work to move around its kennel. I love that idea. We could set that up fairly easily, get some boxes and put some stuff in it, right? Do five minutes. If we've got that five minute period, maybe he gets to do clicker training one day. Maybe he gets to sit and cuddle for another day. Maybe he just does nose work and then a uh, treadmill session. So that's his week, right? I love it. All right, we already talked a little bit about uh, medications also. So we kind of went out of order a little bit. Sorry about that, but that's the way my head works sometimes. Any other questions or things that you want to add to his plan at this point? Retesting his swabs. Retesting his swabs. Yes, don't forget that. That is so important. I'm like, when is he going to get tested? I hope it's today. Don't, don't put him on the list for tomorrow. I'll test it in a day. Yes, we need to get him the heck out of Dodge, right? Yeah. Okay, so what do you want to do for outcome options? So we already want to get him the heck out of Dodge. As soon as he's cleared, he's out of there. Anything else? Anybody want to reassess him after he's out of Dodge? What's that going to help us know? Was it really kennel stress? Was it kennel stress or was it yeah. compulsive? Compulsive. Yeah, or two big differentials, kennel stress or compulsive. Is this going to persist after he's out of there? That's what I want to know. I want to see if these behaviors are going to reduce or if they're going to persist. So. How much damage did we do to this dog by keeping him in quarantine for six weeks? <laughs> so this was our reassessment in a different environment. How many think it's kennel stress now? Anybody still want to hold out for compulsive? Yeah, this was totally kennel stress. He was losing his mind, literally, bouncing off the walls in quarantine. We got him into a larger space. We got him a normal bed. We got to play with him a little bit. We got to hang out with a person. And he's like, oh, my God, life is good. Life is good. And so I got to take this video of him right after he broke out of quarantine. So he had his six weeks in quarantine. He got cleared. They have this middle zone, if you will, where they spend a week in this other zone just to make sure. And then they can finally move to adoption. So this is him in the middle zone in his week there. I'm talking to him here. I'm like, hey, buddy, how are you doing? Are you feeling better? And he's like, yes, I'm feeling awesome, right? He felt so much better. And he's off the meds now. He, we are weaning, he, at this point when I saw this, yes, we are, we are weaning the meds off. I, I like to wean if I can. He'd been on them for six weeks, so we're going to taper him, but we're going to do it pretty quickly. So, yeah, we're going to get him off meds. He's going to the adoption floor. He's going to be okay. So. What this case taught me, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to include him in here, even though this afternoon has been about talking about medication and using them for behavior problems in the shelter, I want to emphasize that the medications are not the end-all be-all, right? We really have to make sure we're paying attention to the other things going on and changing and addressing the areas where we can, not just simply throwing a pill at a dog. The medications are really important, and we saw this with Gilbert from the first video at two weeks and the second video at four weeks and how much that behavior had slowed down, right? But one of the things that I continue to have impressed upon me the longer I do behavior in sheltering world is that never underestimate the power of the environment because you can see drastically different behavior in the same individual animal based on the environment that they're in. And every single time I, try to, I start to forget this, I have another dog or a cat that reminds me yet again. And so if I have someone telling me that they're seeing something drastically different than what someone else reported in a different environment, I'm going to listen to them. And I'm going to have them explain to me exactly what they're seeing. I'm going to ask them for video or I'm going to have that pet come back so I can reassess it because sometimes they're right. Their pet is showing a very different repertoire of behaviors because the environment they're in is different. Sometimes it's a person's perception and they just don't see it. But I'm no longer at the point saying, yeah, yeah, you just don't know how to read body language and the dog's still going to be anxious because he was anxious here. No, I think really we have to make sure that we don't forget that fact. So that was my lesson from Gilbert. I hope that I can impress that upon you as well. And the next case I want to share with you is my little buddy Bill. And Bill taught me a really important lesson too. He actually taught me a lot of good lessons, Mr. Bill did. So Bill is a three-year-old male neutered shepherd mix. You can see here that he has one eyeball. Uh, he was obtained from this shelter, by this shelter, uh, by a transport, 
transport partner. This was a partner they had not worked with before. And they had this sob story when they went down to pull dogs and said, oh, we've got this guy. You know, he had an acute eye injury. We just had to take his eye out. He's a really nice dog. He's just really stressed here. We don't have any resources. We're a high volume, low resource shelters. We need your help. Take Bill. So they go, like, oh, okay, yeah, we'll take Bill, whatever. And then they started to look at the records a little bit closer once they got him up to Chicago. And they realized that Bill had actually been in this other shelter where he came from for two years. M minor detail that they neglected to share. And oh yeah, by the way, the enucleation had happened right after he came into that shelter two years ago. So yes, we all like the dog that's missing the body part because we get the sympathy card played and we can get them out the door faster sometimes. But this is a situation where it really emphasizes the reason it's important to be honest and have full disclosure, whether you're talking to a adopter or a foster or a transport partner it really does no good to the relationship that you're trying to create if you're not being honest or withholding information that could be really critical. This shelter probably would have still taken Bill even if they'd known he'd been there for two years and even if they'd known he'd had the nucleation two years ago but they were really put off by the fact that they didn't share that information so be careful with that and again full disclosure is really a requirement for us so this is what we know about him so far so staff observations, we didn't really have any other information from this shelter that he came from, but we had some staff observations. So they described him as jumpy. And I said, oh, jumpy, what do you mean? Like jumpy mouthy? And they're like jumpy, like he startles hard, like he like hits the deck every time something surprises him, especially if you approach him on his blind side. If a person is going to interact with him, he immediately jumps up and grabs them with his mouth. And so again, going back to Kelly Boland's lectures that I keep referencing, she was talking about the jumpy, mouthy dog and differentiating between a mouthing or a bite, an inhibited bite, right? So there's mouthing as if this is play, I want to interact with you as a dog, but it's not a dog, it's a person. And there's using your mouth to control a situation. Bill was using his mouth to control a situation, okay? So he's, he was jumping up and grabbing and not letting go. That's not normal play behavior. That was, hey, I don't know what to do here. So, obviously people didn't want to spend time with him, if this is the only way he was going to interact with him, but he didn't want the person to leave. So, he would do this if he was in his room and someone tried to sneak out, he grabbed them and not let go. If he was on leash, he would turn around and grab them. If he was training with somebody, he would turn around and grab him. Like, this was literally the only way this dog knew how to interact with people. He did not have any interest in treats and he did not want to be touched. So I was really worried about this guy. He, he, this is the one that, like, I don't sleep well at night after I've seen him because it, it really breaks my heart. So they tried moving him. They tried to change his environment, knowing that oftentimes we'll get a different environment. And we knew that our adoption area had a lot more resources available. This is actually a, a this shelter, I think, has four facilities now. At the point we had Bill, I think they had two. So they had a, a management and medical center and then an adoption center. So they tried to move the adoption center because we knew we had better resources there, more volunteer manpower, more training resources, larger spaces, all that kind of stuff. And just that his stress level actually increased when they moved him to this other area, which was really interesting. And they also tried positive reinforcement-based training, and he got stressed out with that. You know, you would try to do something with him, and he was just like, I can't, I can't, and he would completely disengage. It's really sad. So I got to meet him, and I first saw him in his kennel, and this is what I observed. He barked, he jumped up, and as soon as someone entered his kennel to try to leash him, he jumped up and he grabbed, and he didn't let go. I'm like, oh, this is not good, guys. And even our most experienced handler, who's been training dogs for 25 years, and has been working in this shelter, or with this shelter for about eight, was having a really hard time getting him on leash. And once he was on leash and he was out of the room, he just, he was like a, a whirling dervish. He would dart and he would jump and he was just all over the place and there was like no predicting where on earth he was going to go. Um, the only way he could interact if he saw a person, if he got close enough to a person, was immediately jump up and grab. I'm like, guys, this is not good. And it was a repeated pattern. The more I watched it, it was a repetitive pattern. So jump, grab, down, then he would turn, then jump, grab, down, turn, and it was following the same pattern every interaction. I'm like, hmm, this is really interesting. Still very worried about him, but he was starting to make me curious. And so 
following up with some more interactions, we tried to give him some treats. He couldn't. He couldn't take them. We finally got something. I think it was freeze-dried hot dogs. If we put him directly right in front of his nose, he might think about eating them. But we had to literally like put it on his nose to get him to do anything with it. And if he got startled, which he startled many times during his assessment, and this wasn't a formal assessment. This is just a, 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 a casual assessment of just kind of watching what was going on and trying to interact with him a little bit. He would turn fast and then drop his body. And this was especially prominent when he was approached on his blind side, which we knew, and that was consistent with what we saw with the previous shelter. So things that would make him startle, um, someone dropped a leash on a, on a chair, you know, the metal buckle that kind of clinked when it hit the chair, <laughs> he hit the deck. That's a pretty innocuous trigger, right? Uh, if he was touched, he whipped around at the hand. That was actually one point where he didn't put his mouth on somebody, but he whipped around and made me worried that he would put his mouth on there. We showed him a tennis ball and he ran away. Does that break anybody else's heart? Oh my God, this poor guy. And we tried to give him a squeaky toy, and he's like, I don't know what that is. What do you want me to do with that? So we can only imagine what his life has been like the last three years. So for Bill, let's make a problem list. It's going to be longer than the others, spoiler alert. So anybody want to start? Fear, Fear of? Loud noises and sudden movements. Loud noises and sudden movements, yep. Fear of touch, yep. Anything else? Do I think he's hypersensitive? That would be something I would consider putting on my differential list for sure. What else? Over arousal. So hypervigilant. Yeah. Mm hmm Anybody want to say that he jumps a lot? Mm hmm Anybody else say he grabs with his mouth a lot? Yeah. I don't know that we can necessarily take it any step higher than that, but definitely jumping and grabbing with his mouth needs to be on our problem list. Vision loss, yeah. What about environment? So we have fear of touch, sound. What was the third one someone said? Mm -hmm. Sudden movements. What about environment? Remember when we tried to move him to the adoption center? Change, yeah. He's afraid of a lot of stuff, right? Differentials. What's your differential diagnosis list for him? This is a toughy one. Poor socialization, I would take that. Anxiety. So trauma and abuse could potentially be on there. We don't have enough history, but then I, I wouldn't rule it out. <coughs> yes? Neurologic, neurologic disease. Yeah, it could be neurologic disease. It could be hyperesthesia. He could have some other type of sensory problem from that. Absolutely. We need to do a neuro exam on this dog, right? For sure. Good luck with that, but we need to do it. <laughs> <laughs> what else is on our differential? Yes? We could call it conflict avoidance. Yeah. So that's, it's a learned behavior uh, of uh, fear, right? I don't know what to do, so I'm going to try this. Anybody think this dog might have kennel stress? Yeah, three years long worth of kennel stress, but yeah. it's there. What about generalized anxiety? Perhaps. Transport, yeah. So we had a huge stressor happen. Yeah. Repetitive behavior? Yes, very good. You noticed that I picked up on a pattern. So that repetitive behavior, what could we be dealing with? Compulsive, kennel stress. We, th both of those need to be in our differential, right? So we have a laundry list going here, right? What additional information do we want? We know we want to do a neuro exam. We're going to try to do a neuro exam. What else do we want? Well, why did he come into the other shelter? We don't know. We couldn't get that information. They were not really on great talking terms after this. Visual exam for the other eye. How well can he see from the other eye? We don't know what happened to the first eye that he lost. So he might have impaired vision on the other side. <coughs> Anybody want to examine this dog for pain? Anybody want to do any lab work? I'd take it or leave it. He does the exact same thing when he's there attempting to walk him as he did during our assessment. Jump, grab, let go, turn. Over and over. So you can imagine how fun this dog is to walk anywhere, right? <laughs> yes? Does he have, do they have a large enclosure we could let him run? Yeah, we did that, and he actually did the same behavior in there, too. <laughs> it was really, really quite sad. What about, like, would he run into a kennel? So the question is, would he ever calm down, or did he, would he continue to do this repetitive behavior the entire time he was interacting? 
from our staff observation reports, he never stopped this, and we spent, I think we spent 30 minutes with this dog. He was the last dog of the day, and I was so upset and worried about him that I wasn't ready to let it go. He never, the best we ever got was that if the treat was literally right here in front of his nose, he would take it. That was the best interaction we got the entire 30 minutes. So, does anybody think that that is a normal t amount of time to stay highly aroused? Should a dog start to recover after that period of time? Yeah, so I think we can all agree that that's not, a, not normal either. So how do you want to treat this dog? Drugs. <laughs> drugs, yes! That's why we're here today, is for drugs. Do you want to do the three M's since we did the How I Treat Five last time? All right, so remember our first M is uh, motivation. What do you think his motivation is and how can we address it? Fear? Anxiety, stress? Anyone want to say frustration too? I think you're all right. Yeah. I, I think he is very afraid. I think he's very stressed out, and I think he's very frustrated. So, management. What can we do? <laughs> okay. I'm going to put that in the modification category. We will get there. Don't worry. What else? Quiet environment. Yes. Can we get this dog a quiet environment? I want him to have, like, the zen zone. So quiet, larger, a little bit of music, pheromones if we have it, right? Beat him to the punchline. That's going to fall into our modification category. We'll talk about that for sure. Yes, food puzzles are in modification as well. What else can we do with the environment? What's that? Muzzle train him. That's going to be in our modification. Management, <laughs> environmental management. So we've given him a larger space. We've kind of tried to make it quiet. We've given him music. We've tried pheromones. We did not try him in a foster home. We were too afraid to put him in a foster home because we were afraid somebody was going to get hurt. Let's make it very consistent. Skilled handlers are the only people interacting with him. That's a really good management strategy. Don't put people who are going to get hurt in, the situ in this situation. Very good. Okay, so that would fall into modification too. So she said, can we have someone on the opposite side of a barrier throw him balls so he has something to do? But remember, he was afraid of the tennis ball, right? And he didn't care about the squeaky toy. So not a whole lot we can do management-wise other than trying to get him into a quieter place. And we knew that that stressed him out. So what do we want to do modification-wise? So far we've had drugs. drugs. <laughs> yes, we need drugs. We need, we need to change and beat him to the punch with our modification. What medication do you want to use? Immediate medication, absolutely. Yeah, if somebody said all of them. Yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so we want, this is a case where we need to use immediate medication, right? This is a true, this is a welfare emergency. This is a chronic welfare emergency. This has been going on for three years. He has been in a horrible welfare state for three years. So we need to do something now. What medication do you want to put him on of our immediate acting ones? Trazodone? Yeah, people after my own heart. I'm a trazodone girl. Let's try trazodone. Safe? It's fast acting, twice a day, inexpensive, easy to give, give it a little bit of something. Yeah, we had to try the tone for sure. What else do we want to do? That's a fantastic question. I'm really glad you asked that because I haven't addressed that in some of the other lectures yet. Would I add an SSRI right now too? Because knowing that this was a chronic problem, he's going to be a long term dog, right? I actually would not hesitate to add a chronic long term medication to him. But I like to do one thing at a time because I like to know who to blame the good, bad, and the ugly on. So generally in these cases where I know there's a good likelihood that we're going to need chronic medication in addition to an immediate acting medication, I'll do my immediate acting medication right now. And then in a week, if I'm not seeing side effects, I will add my chronic medication. And one of the reasons I do that is because I use a lot of trazodone and I use a lot of fluoxetine or Prozac, and they tend to have similar side effect mm -hmm. profiles. So I want to know which medication is causing him not wanting to eat or causing stomach upset. And if I'm doing them both at the same time, I don't know. And it gets a lot more complicated to try to weed it out. So this is a more simple, straightforward way that's easier for my shelters to get that information. And we're still addressing the, the dog's welfare today. So what else do we want to do aside from medication? Yes. 
I think that would be a great option. I would not have any problems with adding gabapentin to address potential pain issues or other neuropathies. Uh, hopefully we have that information from our physical exam. If I recall correctly, he did not have any discernible pain and what neuro exam we could do was normal and he was visual in that other eye. So at this point we're really left with mainly psychological problems to deal with. But yeah, that's a really good thought. I wouldn't hesitate to do that anybody either. Anybody wanted to use clonidine? Remember this dog is highly aroused, right? He is jumping off the walls. That would be another really good option. If I had to choose between the two of them, if you said I can only have one, mm -hmm, I would probably still go with the trazodone because I know I can get better coverage dosing it twice a day. And this dog really needs 24 hour coverage. So I'd really be looking at three time a day dosing for the clonidine. So, yes. That's a good question. Yeah, it, it was a multiple person process. She's asking how do we assess him for pain if he's whipping around every time we touch him because he startles. It, it was a challenging process. And I'm not saying that this is the most thorough, best, best performed physical exam of, ever. But you know, in, in terms of trying to have someone kind of hold him forward and keep his attention as best as they could and then have someone have their hands on him and keep their hands on him and move down the body rather than touch and let go, touch and let go, touch and let go. I think you're going to get better information that way, but by no means am I going to say that this was a really great exam. I would submit that if he's that bouncy and active, he's not in that much pain. So that's a good thought, too. If he's that bouncy and active, he's probably not in that much pain. But I would challenge that with saying if a dog is in a really, really high arousal state, their sympathetic nervous system is charged. We've seen dogs who've been hit by cars and have severely fractured limbs get up and walk, right? right? They can be. I've seen dogs who've had pain issues, who've been hyper aroused and look like they don't have pain and they are doing these active anxious behaviors but there's still some pain going on there. It's not a fractured leg that we're seeing the, you know, the limb dangling but there's still some degree of pain there that they're masking because of their arousal level. So, yes. He does not desensitize if we handle him whether he likes it or not. He escalates. So, he was a tough guy. What do we want to do modification wise? Food puzzles. Great. Can feed? Okay. I think that's a good option to try. But remember when we tried to do positive reinforcement with treats, he got more stressed. So we're going to have to watch his body language very closely when we do that to ensure that we don't increase his stress level if we try to hand feed him because that interaction might be too intense for him right now. But certainly worth an experiment. But you have to monitor that intervention and see how he responds. Yes. Do I think a thunder shirt would help him? I don't know. I don't know if we can get a thunder shirt on him. <laughs> and if we got it on him, I don't know if we could get it off. So I don't think we were ready to delve into that yet, but certainly something else to think about. Mm -hmm. So we want to try to redirect his behavior to a more appropriate option. So doing response substitution. We do need to do that, but we need to have someone who's skilled enough to be faster than this dog, and he's pretty darn fast. We had two people in the shelter that could do that. So that was something we did. We put him in a very intense training program with these two people and these two people only. And the first thing that we started doing was trying to help him sit with food right here on his nose, helping push him back into the sit with that food in his nose. And that was the only thing that we could get this dog to do. I thought, if we're, my God, if we can get this dog to do anything like that, I'm going to be shocked. I thought this dog was going to be slated for euthanasia because by the time I came back in two weeks, I expected him to have bitten somebody bad enough that we were going to have to euthanize him. I didn't think he was going to walk out of here. I felt so horrible for this dog. So obviously we're going to follow up with him. I'm going to come back in two weeks, but do I want to hear about him before then? Yeah. You betcha. Yes. If we were in a shelter with fewer resources, what the appropriate steps for this dog would have been? In all honesty, if I had been in that shelter where he came from, there's no way he would have sat there for two years. He would have been transferred out or I would have recommended them euthanize him if he didn't have any other options because it is inhumane for them to have kept him in that shelter for two years with no outlet and no enrichment and allowing him to get this bad. It's just it's unfair to him. And it's, it's a safety risk. I mean, we saw how dangerous he was. It wasn't being malicious, but it was dangerous. This, this is unacceptable. So he needed to get out of there. And if they didn't have the resources to have someone work with him intensively and add medications on, he needs to go to heaven. That's not fair. And that might be a controversial thing to say, but I don't think it's fair to this dog. My job is to protect safety and to look at welfare and try to make it better. And if we can't do that, if we cannot keep people safe, 
and the animals around them safe, and we cannot make the welfare better. And the shelter admitted they did not have the resources to do it, which is why they were trying to move this dog. He never should have sat there for two years. So, so I'm going to see him back in two weeks. I want to hear from them beforehand. When do you want to hear about him? Daily? Yeah, I did too. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So they were reporting to their veterinarian and the re behavior team daily. They were reporting to me a couple times a week. So I was keeping tabs on how he was doing. So <laughs> he was a long-termer. We knew he was going to be a long-termer, right? We saw this come in. Like I said, I, I thought he was either going to go to heaven really quickly or he was going to be a while before we could put him at home. But he actually started to make gradual improvements. First thing that happened when I came back in two weeks, and I was shocked at this, they said he can sit. He can only sit if the handler is on his non-blind side, but we, he can sit if I lure him in a low distraction area. Oh my God. <laughs> I, was, I was thrilled. Don Trazodone, he could sit. So we continued to take that and build upon it, and it took a long time and it was a very slow process, but he learned to sit. He learned to settle. Oh my God. Anybody ever think this dog could have done that? I didn't think he could do that. So they taught him how to lie down on a bed and settle at a station. He learned how to down. He learned how to make eye contact. He learned how to be released. But he still had zero interest in toys. But he was also able to start to interact with other dogs, and he couldn't do that before either. So we started to be able to add to his options for enrichment as his stress level was decreased. He was still on his trazodone. I do believe that we added fluoxetine for him, and I'm pretty sure we added clonidine too, layering these things upon uh, with each assessment. But we were moving in the right direction. And that's the other thing I want to point out with him. I thought he was on death's door. I wasn't expecting things to get better. But I saw him back at two weeks, and things were getting better. His welfare was improving. His safety was improving. And because those two things were getting better, I was willing to continue to work on our plan and modify and keep moving forward. Okay, Even though I knew he was going to be a long-term stay, and I don't really love having dogs in the shelter this long, he was moving in the direction that we wanted him to. Long story short, long story short, I think he was in the shelter for six to nine months. He actually got adopted. I think I cried that day. I got an email. I'm like, oh, my God, Bill got adopted. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to cry. They did a lot of adoption counseling with the owners. They're like, are you sure you want Bill? No, really. <laughs> I mean, let me tell you about Bill. He's a special guy. Yeah, he's got one eye, and he's really cute, but let me tell you about Bill. They educated him on his background, where he came from what his problems were, what the implications of that level of extreme chronic stress for that long period of time in his life probably is going to have on him lifelong. He's not going to be a normal dog, right? So they knew that he was going to be a work in progress. They were willing to take that challenge on. They wanted to do a lot of training, and they knew they were going to need to do a lot of training with them, and they had a very controlled environment for him. So they were going to try to set him up for success. And they were willing to continue his medication. So we sent medication home with him, um, and uh, he was supposed to, this is after I left Chicago, so he was supposed to follow up with another uh, behavior person, veterinary behavior person, after I left, which I believe he did, but I don't remember exactly who that was. But we got another update. Several months after he got adopted, we got a lovely update, and these are the ones that make me do what I do, right? He was able to go on a walk. A year later, he was able to go on a walk. He had to wear a freedom harness and no pull harness. That was humane, because he still would do that kind of darty thing sometimes, but he was able to go on a walk. They couldn't walk him when he was at the shelter. He learned how to hand target. He learned how to sit and wait at the crosswalk. Anybody ever think this dog could do that? Jump, grab, turn, down. Oh, my God. That's impulse control, right? He could play with some dogs. They found some dog buddies for them, and as long as they had kept it under control, he did well, which is another good form of enrichment for him. He no longer jumped in mouth for attention. And the thing with this dog, where this repetitive behavior came from, I think it was a very well-rehearsed practice behavior, and I think he realized that the only way he could have some type of social interaction in the two years that he was in that previous shelter was by grabbing onto somebody with his mouth. Because they were so under-resourced, they had so many dogs and so few people, that it was literally go in, clean, feed, out, you know, and no, no other interaction than that. And the only way to get somebody's attention, you know, bark at them, jump on him, paw at him, look cute, you know, wag your little tail, didn't work. But if you grabbed him with your mouth, 
they had to pay attention, right? Like, oh my God, let go of my arm. Stop that. It was something, right? I think that motivation was social, and that was the only way he knew. And so practicing that and that only for two years left him with that single behavior repertoire as his only coping strategy for any type of social interaction. So it took a lot of work to get that undone. But sometimes the lesson that he taught me was sometimes we can actually do that. Uh, they were able to reduce his trisodone. He was still on medications, but they were a lower dose than what we'd previously done. And he was still afraid. He said, oh, well, in this new environment where he's settled and he's coped, he's still afraid of loud noises and some objects. Okay, so we had that laundry list of stuff that we thought maybe he was afraid of, right? Well, this is a way for us to kind of fine-tune that, again, even though it's a year down the road, of what the in initiating triggers potentially were. Noises, well, that makes sense being in a shelter, right? Gosh, that's going to drive you batty if you're afraid of noises and you're in a loud shelter. And he began to play. He finally found a toy he liked. He had a soft frisbee and he liked to play. So this is Bill lying on his owner's bed. So that made me... So sad, so happy. Okay, so this is another group that we got, an eight, uh, eight young dogs, eight young small adult dogs that came from an out-of-state transfer. Um, we think they might have come from some type of hoarding situation, but we didn't have all the details. And the shelter staff, this is one that we caught on our walkthrough. They said, they're fine, they're fine. They just bark a lot. So I'm gonna show you a video. I'm gonna ask you, do you think they're fine? Watch the body language. <laughs> He's not fine. Thank you for saying that. Is he fine? No. Panting with licking, ears back. Can you appreciate this dog is trembling? Lip lick yawn. What's he saying? Get the heck away from me. Oh my god. Anybody notice what's happening on his nose? He's got a little rub on his nose from rubbing the kennel. Are they fine? No. Any of these dogs fine. No. Fine. What does fine mean? <laughs> this is my other pet peeve. People say they're fine. Fine means the absence of reaction. Usually the absence of aggression essentially. But fine is not fine. Usually there is a welfare state that we need to investigate. Fine can be fearful, fine can be stressed, can be frustrated. So I always ask people, what does it look like when they're fine? Don't take that as an answer. So we're going to whip through this because we don't have time for us to play our, our Jeopardy game. Um, but I'm going to give you a quick and dirty problem list that I made for that room of dogs that we just saw. And then we'll talk about what we could do for them. Dog one, that brown and white Shih Tzu, did you notice that we were circling? It was a slow circle. There were little pauses in it, but it was still circling, right? Dog two, the little brown and white terrier with the squinty eyes, right? He was lip licking, he trembling, his tail was down. Everybody said, oh God, he's not fine. Dog three, that was the little chihuahua thing at the top, right? Barking, wide eyes, backing up, he was very stiff. Dog four was the little brown terrier where we all said, oh, maybe he's okay. Maybe better than the others, right? But did you notice the paw lift? That's a conflict or a displacement behavior. He was panting, his ears were pulled all the way back, his eyes were wide as saucers. This little guy is really stressed too, right? And what about the little wire-haired dog? You notice him trembling, then he sniffed into that big yawn and a lip lick. And then that spitzy looking pug thing, right? The fawn, he was barking, whale eye, he kind of rushed up to the front and then he backed away because that was really scary, right? He's not fine either. And then the last one, the little tricolored chihuahua thing. He lip licked, he approached, he withdrew, right? So a little bit of conflict, I want to, but I'm afraid. Bounced around, he barked, and then that rub on his nose. We know what that's from, right? Hit in the front of that kennel. So this is a room full of kennel stress, right? So remember what we talked about with the kennel stress. Increased barking, jumping, or lunging at passersby. So oftentimes we see this with frustration. They have a hard time focusing during play or training. Or they're hiding, trembling, cowering, excessively drooling in their current housing system. And remember, the hallmark of this is that there's no history of this behavior previously in the previous environment. Or we can see those repetitive behaviors. 
So the circling, the pacing, the tail chasing, shadow and reflection chasing, stereotyped pouncing, other repetitive behaviors. I have a laundry list of videos that I've collected working through shelters of repetitive stereotyped behaviors that are due to kennel stress. So any of these can fit into that category. And all of those dogs fit into this category, right? So basically our working diagnosis is this room has kennel stress. So what do we do? What can we do for these guys? We can change the environment. That was a hard room to live in, right? So we have metal shoreline crates side to side. This is a pretty small room, so what you saw is pretty much what the room is. You can imagine how loud it was in there. Easily, easily 100 decibels. All of those dogs barking, echoing off that metal. The ones that were jumping and barking were making the whole bank of cages rattle. Jeez, can you imagine? Oh my God, we had to get them out of there, right? Anything else we can do? Or you wanna do before we reassess them? We don't really know how used they were to be being together. We knew they came in together, but that was all the information that they had. Uh, yeah, we, we definitely do want to do that when we have the manpower and the time to do that. We do want to assess them individually. So the first thing that we did is said, this is not fine. This cannot continue. And we did that. We, we changed the environment. We got them into larger spaces. We spread them out, and we started to reassess them individually. And this is actually what we saw once we did that. What are you doing? You I'm talking to her here. Hey, do you feel better in this new environment? How is life? Yeah. That's a little better. She's still barking at me, but the barking has changed dramatically. She's coming up to the front. She's not doing the, oh my God, you're kind of scary, back and forth, back and forth. She's wagging her tail. And wagging tail really just means intent to move forward. It can be any motivation aside from that. But the rest of her body language was not showing to me that she was threatened. She was still a little afraid, right? But she was much less stressed than she was in the room. So, do we think this dog needs medication? No. Probably not. I will tell you that we got pretty much the same thing with all the rest of the dogs when we moved them out of that awful, mm -hmm. awful room. Mm -hmm. So, our working diagnoses for these dogs, pretty much all of them was kennel stress and fear. We couldn't differentiate whether it was environmental, noise, other dogs, people, whatever. We knew they'd just recently been transported. That's stressful. We knew we'd just put them in an unfamiliar environment. That's stressful. We knew it was loud in there. That was stressful. That room wasn't the most fragrant, lovely fragrant. And unfamiliar dogs housing in people. So, I mean, if there was something that we could do that we could be frightening to these dogs, we essentially did it to them in this room. So we moved them to a larger, quieter area. We did group house them in pairs. So rather than all eight in single housing, we did two and two and two and two. And some of them we did put on trazodone short term. And they all went to the adoption center and very quickly got adopted because they're cute and little and it's Chicago and we were able to discontinue their medications as soon as they were out the door. Yes? I think they were gone within a week. So my short term, what was that? It, I, yeah, by the time we got them from the medical center, transferred to the adoption center, paired, meds started for those that needed them, by the end of that week they were out. So the entire process took a week, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is a short course for me for trazodone? I will actually keep it on board as long as they're stressed in that environment. Remember, I'm reassessing every two weeks. So if that two weeks I think they still need it, they get another two weeks and another two weeks. And if I know they're probably going to be here for another two months, I'll just do the script for two months. That's okay. I'd probably want to wean it if I could after that long, but it's not going to kill them if, if I don't. Yes? Do you tell people if they're on Absolutely. Do I tell them if they're on trazodone? Absolutely. That's full disclosure. They need to know that. They need to know what it is, why I'm giving it to them, what to expect, what we've seen so far, and what to do about it while they continue it, for sure. With these dogs, they did not continue it at home because they didn't need to. So my instructions were that they weren't. It was very short term. I didn't feel like they needed to wean it. We were just using it for this immediate situation. Bill, we asked them to continue it at home, and they did. And they adjusted the dose per our recommendations as we followed up with him, with their veterinarian. Yeah, so you're asking about using trazodone as a bridging medication to get us to the point where the fluoxetine works? Absolutely, yeah. If I think the dog's going to need chronic medication, I want to have the dog on fluoxetine or something like that. And I don't want to let them sit there and deteriorate, so I'll use the trazodone until that the I think the fluoxetine is working. And sometimes I need to keep them both on short term. So that's fine, for sure. I think we are out of time, but if you have other questions, I'm happy to stick around.